have no room in here, right? So it's not like we're waiting for someone else to show up and go, oh wait, nobody's coming. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Welcome to uh, to catch a penetration tester. Uh, we're going to talk about our top SIM use cases today. So it is a Chris Hansen uh, to catch a predator theme. So why? What was your plan for coming here today? Um, so we're going to we'll talk about a little bit about us. We're going to talk about some of the methodology and criteria that we came up with to presenting the top 10 use, SIM use cases that we're talking about today. Uh, we're going to go over some recommendations. And just in case you didn't know, our th the theme is that Chris Hansen is the blue team and the penetration testers are the perverts. And so, uh, and it's also, <laughs> also attackers. So penetration tester, pervert, attackers, external attacker, we're talking about the same thing. That's what our, that's what our use cases are what we're talking about today. A little bit about myself in this order. I'm a Christian uh, and a husband and a father. Uh, I oversee an information security program. Uh, I've uh, graduate of RIT. Yeah. I don't have a football team. We don't have a football team, but yeah. <laughs> That's right. Won every game. 13 years InfoSec experience. I've uh, nine years specifically with the SIM uh, deployments. I have two different SIM exp uh, experience backgrounds. This talk is a vendor agnostic talk. This is coming from in just a lot of this is coming from experience from us and the people we know we're, we're talking about today. I've implemented over 12 different enterprise security systems uh, from the ground up. That means starting from a problem to a full uh, a program and a solution, a, a program. Uh, as mentioned before, I think I mentioned, I developed two different security operation programs. Uh, I spoke last year on uh, simplified SIM use case management, really trying to identify and present uh, how we manage our monitoring systems, such as SIM, uh, and how to best uh, track and do everything that we can and try to bull the ocean. So check that out from last year. Introduce to you Pete. Hey, how's everyone doing? <laughs> so I'm Greek, as you can tell by the last name. So I'm a terrible golfer. I drink bourbon a lot better. Uh, I guess I have about 15 years in FOSEC. Um, mostly blue team, dabble in the red a lot, have some certs. And uh, I've been, I think I missed one year. And so I've been here five times and first time speaking. And uh, that's me in a nutshell. So. Uh, so why are we here? You know, Pete and I, we're, we're very blue. And, but we love coming to DerbyCon and talks like this to understand what the Red's doing. Uh, and, and really, when we go to an event like this, our, our goal is to come home uh, with some ideas for our organizations and our, and our employers. You know, there's a, and, and so we wanted to, 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 share, to, to share what we love about coming to, to cons like this. Uh, the typical derby con, uh, the typical not talk, con talk would be to you, you explain a technology, you hack it, you defend it, but every time, every time, in every one of those talks, there's a little bit of, well, how do you detect it? And so that's what we're talking about and focusing on today. We are sharing a collection of the use cases in mass quantities, hopefully within one talk. We hope to address the question, what can most blue teams do that most likely catch red attackers in most environments. I'll add to that. So, questions. Who, who has a SIM? Great. <laughs> Are you detecting the right things? Does your mailbox get blown up with alerts and you just ignore them? Come on, be honest. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm kind of confused, you know, Ryan's a big Chris Hansen fan. I've seen a few episodes. So, you know, in one hour, was it an hour? Yeah. So in one hour with commercials, he caught the perv. And I read somewhere it takes us blue teamers 165 days to catch an attacker. So I don't know. I'm just saying things are broken. Um, we're not doing a good job with the Sims. They're full of shit and 
Yeah, yeah but Pete, those sims have out-of-the-box content to detect the attackers. What are you talking about? I mean, they suck. You pay thousands of thousands of dollars for them, and well, okay. You splunk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's that's the answer, which could be. So what you might be thinking, there's some assumptions before we get started on our use cases. We understand that prevention is first and foremost. No doubt we should be focusing on prevention. We're going to assume that most organizations are, have done, have already done, or doing everything they can. They have pen, penetration testers. They, they're do, they have a vulnerability mo management program. The assumption is that there's processes in place um, to, to do the prevention. And most organizations have a monitoring program, such as an MSSP, uh, Managed Security Service Provider, or, or an in-house in-place SIM, or a little bit of both. It's sometimes, and we understand that sometimes risk due to vulnerabilities aren't addressed by simply, or you just cannot prevent or pr pr you know, protect something. You can't, if you can't install a patch, for example, oh, who knows, I'm just throwing out an example. You, 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 if you have a vulnerability and you have a requirement for the business to continue or your organization to continue uh, with that vulnerability, that risk is sometimes mitigated through detection. We're also going to assume that the audience knows the attacks that we're talking about. Um, the attacks that we're talking about are it's nothing sexy, it's nothing I think you, every, most people have heard uh, of these before. Yeah, so the methodology we used um, was is we surveyed our friends who are pen testers and some forensic um, specialists who actually do that and it was two different types of perspectives that came into us, which um, not still in the thunder, but it was basically lateral movement and exfil, um, most of these use cases. So anyways, um, that was our methodology, and then we'll go into some criteria here. So we analyzed the data based on some criteria, and that's uh, basically the next slide. Yeah, so, so, we, so, <laughs> so we reached out to several penetration tests and other security uh, pen, uh, professionals to get their advice, say, hey, this is our criteria. This is kind of how we want the format in. Uh, please send us your top five SIM use cases. Uh, and so we gathered that. So what is a SIM use case? Uh, like I mentioned, I talked about this last year. It is a documented output for your SIM or monitoring program. In, simpl in simplistic terms, it's what you're, what you're SIM to do. And it defines the who, what, where, when, why, how. And then when you get, and, and like we're, we're talking about alerts today. Uh, actually, what we're presenting is actionable alerting um, logic that will detect, that will that will spawn an alert that most organizations should be doing. So the use case criteria we asked the submitters to do was to really think about um, what would you know what kind of alerts could be generated in the kill chain, and. Um, and, you know, the typical intrusion pen test scenario that, that we threw out to the submitters was fish, compromise, workstation, steel credentials, own stuff, lateral movement, own stuff, and then exfil. And, and we got some good results back, so we're going to share those with you. And, um, and, and like I said in our earlier slide, a lot of them really were the, the lateral movement and the exfil at the very end. So, I mean, that's what we'll talk about today. Yeah, we did seem to get a lot of lateral movement detection use cases. Uh, some of the criteria that we, we were looking for in our SIM use cases, additionally, was that they're doable in 90% of organizations. Um, you know, we're assuming that there's basic technology exists in an organization. There's an assumption there that you have AV, you have IPS, you maybe got layer 7 firewalls, possibly, possibly uh, proxies. So typical basic technologies, and it's, this is really at the theory level. Um, common infrastructures. Active Directory, everybody has, most people, most organizations have Windows, uh, Unix, databases, but we just didn't, we didn't want to limit on specific technologies. But we did get several use cases on the Windows side, which kind of makes sense, I guess. Uh, there are also the, the, the criteria is that the log feeds in a SIM already, or typically, exist. Um, most SIM, when you deploy a SIM, there's out-of-the-box type of integrations and uh, Windows seems like it would be a really easy integration. Syslog is a very easy integration. Integrations like that where most uh, SIM deployments will have a, a, a log feed. 
We also can, we wanted to make sure that the use cases we're talking about today, or that they're collecting and talking about today, that they're low effort to develop in the sim. There could be some really complex sim use cases that involve co correlating data from, you know, data man. Sometimes uh, it, it's, it, there's lots. Of, you could correlate data with lists, manually uh, updated lists, um, and just correlate it with other data. We're trying to keep things simple today. They can be considered the basics or the must-do of detection. And we picked the top 10 of the use cases that we selected based on several factors. Uh, one of them was common themes of submission. So if we got a use case from one person, another person, another person, well, this is uh, we're, we're going to present on that. And the other thing that we talked about were there were some uses, use cases that kind of overlapped. Yeah. Um, and we, we, we talked about some of the theory around it as well. Well, this one use case does this, and this one use case does this, but this one does, will catch this one as well. So use case A, use case B, it would also, use case B would catch use case A, and also detect on B, so it's, we, we talked a little bit about that. All right, so let's get started into our use cases. We're going to go through our top ten, and Pete has the first one. Yeah, so this is a whole lot of data, I mean, to take in, so, you know, I know a lot of you are going to try to read it all, but I'm, I'll go over the format real quick so you can get the basics and then we'll dive right in. So foremost, um, the title, use case. In this case, this is an authentication with corporate credentials to an untrusted site, the fish. Um, the uh, submitter, just giving them some credit. And uh, the data source, so where it's coming from. In this case, it's coming from a proxy log. In, in a lot of organizations don't log their proxy log information or don't have proxies. Um, but in this case, we still chose this because we thought this was a kind of neat one. The correlated data source is a lot of times when you're working with a sim, you have to put your own data into it. So this would be, in this case with the fish, this would be a list of sites. Like, for instance, um, just to throw some service now or any third party software as a services that your company might use that are quote unquote all authorized. So, so that's the list we're using today. That, that will be the white list. Um, the goal of this is to detect a compromised account that had went out to fish and offered up their user credentials. Um, the description just tells you a little bit more about what the submitter was thinking. And in this case, he was clearly thinking that a user who had clicked on that link and offered up their corporate AD user credentials. Um, the pseudocode, you'll see a lot of different variations. I apologize in advance. Um, like some are coming out of some of the popular uh, sims and some are just plain old good, good pseudocode. So in this case, um, like I said, the log source is from a proxy log and in basically looking at what was posted. So um, if in the post body the, the user credentials masked your whitelist of uh, users and also wasn't part of the uh, whitelist of allowed websites, you would alert on that. And, and typically this is uh, one that you would I mean, I would recommend that you would automatically um, disable, either disable that account or reset the password, let the user know. And if you're using any kind of um, um, security education awareness framework, is, is auto-enroll them in the training and uh, hopefully gets better. So, that, so that's what this one is, is basically about. So we thought this was a unique one. Okay, the next one is server to internet communication uh, beyond a baseline. So the data source for this use case is, is your edge, edge networking equipment. Uh, you got a, your proxies, your local firewalls, local or edge firewalls, uh, and then traffic leaving uh, your server networks. So, so your server networks, in theory, should never initiate outbound connections to the internet, which then sends a log through your firewall, which goes into your monitoring program. This is where you should develop a baseline of that traffic. So, and if you have traffic beyond that baseline, well, that traffic should, that communication should, uh, the, the communication that's initiated should be uh, investigated. Why did this come beyond, beyond our baseline? Um, some organizations hopefully are blocking the egress of their, their the, the network of their server, um, should be in some kind of DMZ, or blocking the egress to the internet. Um, communication so hopefully if and that's okay you can servers can still attempt they won't be successful this this use case still works again the operations team uh, rule out the false positives 
And uh, like Pete, Pete mentioned before, if you can't read what's on here, the, there's a download link up below, and I'll, we'll provide the download link to these use cases and the ones that were submitted for you. So I think everyone heard of password spraying, right? Um, um, uh, Black Hills has a good video, but anyways, so user password spraying. So this is what this will detect. The data source is, you know, your domain controller logs. Um, the the correlated data source is password spray user list. Um, so uh, the, so the goal here is is that a lot of times when an attacker gets in through a fish or whatever, they want to try common passwords against your whole your whole enterprise. And um, so low and slow. So this is what this one detects. And this could be a little tricky to set up. Um, I have set this one up, and it's a little tricky, but um, based on the logic. But basically, you're looking for account, and you could use 10 or more. 10 seem to be my sweet spot. But account of 10 unique targets coming from the same source IP um, with, failed, with a failed login, and then you would alert on that. And typically, that would be a sign of a lateral movement. Um, and also, password spraying, what I've seen, is also done externally as well. So you could combine um, your firewall logs here as well, because they might be trying to do this with Burp or something like that with OWA as well. So I wouldn't only look at your domain con uh, control log. I, I would also mature it to look at your firewall to get that source IP as well. Um, and like I said, Black Hills did a really good video on this about uh, two years ago, doing recon. So yeah, so both Pete and I have experienced the, uh, this use case with both uh, in penetration testers. Um, not necessarily attackers, but penetration testers have used this. Right. Um, and, and, and I think I think one of the keys is they test just enough of the most unique passwords just below your lockout policy, so they're not locking out users. Uh, and if they get a user account, well then they win. Antivirus, virus detected on server. So this is a use case to detect stupidity. We all know that antivirus is certainly avoidable. Uh, we, but you know, we're humans. We make mistakes. Not all criminals are smart. So this, and also SIMs typically have an easy data feed uh, to, to monitor your antivirus system. So yes, it may sound stupid, but it's just it's a, it's a very quick win. Uh, we all it's a very quick win. So we have experienced uh, with system administrators when deploying this use case that they say, "Oh wow, great! Antivirus caught the server or caught the virus." Yeah, why are you bothering me? <laughs> why are you bothering me? It 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 is great. Well, um, how to get there? <laughs> Okay, they, they, they kind of need understood, well, okay, yeah. A lot of hacker tools are detected by virus, not all of them. They could be bypassed, I get it, but we make mistakes. So this is um, an obvious one here. So Windows Workstation and Workstation Communication. Um, it was uh, submitted by both uh, Nick and Brett, the forensic person. They see this a lot when they take an image. But basically, um, so this would rely on you having good asset management, knowing what your workstations are, knowing what your na uh, naming standards are for the workstation. That would be the correlated da data source, which you would have to pump into your SIM and keep that updated as best you can. Um, the goal is to detect that external attacker using whatever tools to uh, do lateral movement and own more targets. Um, the description stated that, but basically the logic is really simple here. So if the source IP is in the workstation list and the, desti and the destination IP is in the workstation list, then alert potential lateral movement. And, you know, like, I'm going to date myself, but 20, 30 years ago, people might have had share, 20, 30 years ago, 15 years ago, people might, it might have been common for people to have shares on their workstations and use those. But now, I mean, I really think in your common enterprise, this just shouldn't happen. And another thing these submitters are saying is, is, is you know, you really should have a policy against this, having shares on your workstations. Um, so this is kind of common, but this, um, like I feel, is a good one. We'll catch some good stuff. And also, when you do see this, 
you know, there could be a lot more going on with that workstation as well. So to mature this one, you know, correlate it against, you know, your AV logs, your, your black, your firewall logs. So you could really mature this one. This is in its simple, you know, simple state, because I guess you could have some false positives. Right, and again, with, with whether you allow or deny workstation to workstation traffic, uh, even if you deny it, well, it's probably worth investigating. And this next use case is user added to Windows local or domain administrator group. You know, a lot of penetration testers, attackers, want to get godlike, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, access to your, to your, your domain and then all the data that it provides. Uh, it's a common woohoo, I made it goal uh, for attackers and penetration testers. So really, um, when any user is added to a domain administrator group, this is, again, this is right out of Windows, security event log, it's a pretty easy one to write a rules on. Um, it's detecting privilege escalation, so, and possibly persistence. If you're not monitoring, uh, you should really monitor the groups. Uh, list out some other groups here other than domain administrator and administrators, uh, enterprise admins, scheme admins. Those are also the high level type security groups, which should rarely change unless there is a staff change within your organization on your system administrator side. So let's say that happens. You're, you would get the alert, validate that from your uh, access management system or ticketing system, whatever, however you use to do to document your access changes, make sure that that change is valid, it's authorized. Uh, if you don't know, ask your sysadmins, and if you still don't know, well then uh, you got a security investigation to start. And then the other point here is, is when you're implementing that, if you have an enterprise good uh, change management system, a lot of them do integrate with your SIM, so you can actually um, integrate it in such a more automated fashion to see if there was a change. To reduce um, false positives. Yeah, yes. to reduce false positives. Um, or, you know, you catch a, a sysadmin just not following policy as well. Um, so, this, so this one is the unauthorized service account successful login to a server. Um, again, this is your domain controller. Um, and the couple things you have is going to have is a service account list and host name baseline. So this, so basically the table is going to say, hey, this service account can log into these uh, three or four servers. If you see anything other than that, alert. So you know this is another one in the same uh, like you know. So someone uh, got got a service account and trying and now trying to use it um, with another server to log in. So look into that security, we'll review that. And again, that could be, a, sometimes it's a new sysadmin, you know, that just tried to use it, you know, so look at that, quickly rule it out, and uh, that's that one there. This next one is uh, Windows New Service Account Creation Registration. This, did, this one came from one of our forensic uh, professionals that we know. Uh, this is a lot of time. Um, this is when a new when a new service is created on a, a Windows workstation. It should be very, very, very rare that at, that ever occurs, and should trigger you to investigate when that occurs. Because there's a persistence technique. A lot of persistence techniques revolve around uh, service creation. Uh, so definitely take a look at that. Workstations, again, this also should never happen on workstation servers. Again, if you have change control, uh, a system that can, I, I, you know, find uh, or, or identify what changes are authorized, check that. If it's not there, maybe invest, start investigating a security incident. So this, so this one was interested or submitted. It was seen in actual, uh, you know, another forensic uh, analysis. Um, and this service account performing non-service account actions. In this case, um, assume you have a service account. Its main job is li in life is to do backups, to make backups, um, or to execute the backup service, whatever. Um, and all of a sudden, that service account starts mapping UNC drives, starts doing all kinds of other stuff. So for this one to really uh, work again, you need to you 
this one will take a little bit more tuning, but what we're saying here is, is that it would be a service account with all the allowed event ID. So this will take about a while to tune and do this, but this, this, I mean, this could be very valuable. And if you think about PowerShell execution, if you're logging that, um, it could help. Um, so that's this one here. And, uh, and this was submitted, and this was seen in a real live uh, compromise. Yeah, yeah. I was really, I was really impressed with this one uh, because, I, you know, it, it's it's simple. All your service accounts in your organization have specific should be authenticating with specific event IDs. If you see something beyond that event ID, something either is new or is being used in a way that you really shouldn't use that service account. This one, this is the last one we're, we're talking about. Uh, this is NetFlow or data upload threshold exceeded traffic to internet. It's trying, the attempt is here to detect the exfil of your attacker. You got edge NetFlow firewall or proxy logs. Uh, we kept the word NetFlow in uh, the title because it is a very widely supported uh, protocol and service that's available on almost dumb router type equipment and um, in that your edge internet is, is possible so a lot of organizations could possibly do it fairly easily and also sims typically consume NetFlow and understand and parse out the different fields such as the bytes out or octet um, I think it's D octets uh, value which is the amount of data leaving or in 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 your flow uh, you want to correlate that to server networks, uh, workstations that might be very difficult to do because people are uploading, users are uploading all the time. But uh, if your servers are, are uploading data, uh, you know, that's certainly something that's worthy of investigation. So our threshold that we defined here is, and this is again coming from server networks, uh, if, you're, if any cert, one host delivers approximately 10 megabytes within a minute uh, from a server to an internet or untrusted or even untrusted host, you could add, um, we tried not to bring um, third party type of information uh, or threaten almost kind of like SIM threat intelligence, like IP blacklist type of information uh, into our, our uh, use cases, but you can add that to possibly uh, make the use case a little better. Yeah, it's a little, yeah, it's a maturity item with that. Uh, you know, the response is typically to review for false uh, detections, um, identify you know, what communications was this uh, was it trying to do? There was was reaching out to the internet for some purpose. Is it a new check your change control system? Is it a new service or new system uh, that's that's being installed on the on the server? Um, and again, it escalate if, if you don't know what it's all about. Yeah, you'll have all your data by the time you do that. Um, that's our, that was our last one. Yeah, that was the last one. Oh, so there's a lot of honorable mentions, and, I, and we encourage you to download this and uh, participate. Our, our goal really here is to um, much, and I'll say snort six, um, you know, much to get as many use cases as we can and rank them and put them out there for the community. So we're in the infancy here. So we're just starting out. Um, and, uh, you know, we hope to do this more and more. We hope to uh, also learn from everything here to make more use cases, all, all the sessions. Um, there's one I'll just uh, point out about halfway down the slide, there's a new virtual machine being spawned. So, there was a uh, incident where the attacker actually, for uh, months, um, had got the uh, VMware Essex credentials, made a new host, and then uh, in the off hours, just would you know exfil data there and pop it out. So, so, so this is a good one um, to look at, um, and you'll see that in there as well. Um, but you could read the other ones. I think um, a good. A good honorable mention, go back to that slide. Okay. Another good honorable mention that uh, didn't make the top 10 was PowerShell detection, unauthorized commands of PowerShell. Uh, that is one that we kind of knew about but didn't get to document it fully. So I think it, that would certainly a contender for a, a top 10 as well. <laughs> a whole talk in itself. Possibly a whole talk, <laughs> yes. Um, so recommendations, this is the... Um, 
the the recommendation part of the three way here. So what I'm telling the blue team is learn some red, run some tools, see their logs, do it in dev. Don't do it in the wild, of course. But you can monitor production logs, though. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the next uh, is, is um, and this is an important one, you know, when you're, and you've probably heard a number of people, especially last year, I think this came up in a couple of talks, but when you do a third-party test, and, you know, make sure you put in there value, you know, to evaluate your use cases, because the only way you're going to get better is by evaluating yourself. Yeah, statement of work. Yeah. And then this is a good one. Encourage your, you know, in your statement of works uh, for, you know, your third-party pen tests, um, ha have them put in a section about SIM use cases, like what could have caught the attack. I mean, I think that's important. I mean, have them talk your language, um, you, especially if you, if you own that engagement. Um, and the next one, this goes out to uh, when I was getting my GCIH, I think Ed always told us, says, you know, learn, learn from what's around you, learn from current events. If they, if they publish the anatomy of the attack, like Target or whatever, I mean, learn from that. There's, there's a lot of good things to learn. Those are all, you know, there's like three or four use cases you could implement there. Um, if you know, for the red, if you know, when you um, do your pen test report, add in your findings some use cases. Help us out. You know, help, help us think like you. You know, that's what that's what it's all about. And um, and another thing that I really liked, I think some of the best pen tests that I've ever been a part of receiving on being a receiving at is where they actually went step by step on anatomy of attack and really looking at that because a lot of uh, you know a lot of us blue guys you know we we get the tools we hear about it we play a little bit but really understanding that attack and where we can identify that um, that point of detection is key so I mean that's really my advice and we have some time here about 15 minutes so what's that oh yep yeah, do this one sorry <laughs> Yeah, so like I mentioned, uh, here's the URL for downloading everything, the presentation today and all of our submissions. Uh, we, um, you know, uh, we are inviting you to participate in this effort to grow uh, and, and build the publicly available SIM or monitoring program use case uh, uh, database, we'll call it. And um, so we understand that you, may, you certainly have ideas. And what you are probably, if you are out there and you're saying, well, this is one where I really know was really good and meets all the criteria that we just talked about, we would really, really appreciate and love to hear from you. Just shoot us an email, and our emails are right here. And, um, and, and we also encourage you to, when it comes out, and if it ever does, the Hanson versus Predator uh, has a kickstart, and Hanson's, I think, splitting from, I believe, splitting from Dateline and starting his own um, little business and to uh, continue with the To Catch a Predator type series. So that's pretty exciting. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions and comments. We have a, a few minutes. Yes, sir. Yes. So the question is, with tight budgets of organizations, how does an organization collect workstation logs and perform the use case that we talked about? There are several ways. First is your endpoint security systems. If you have an endpoint security system that, for example, has a local firewall or is an antivirus system, you should be theoretically get them typically from a centralized database or location, point your SIM or monitoring tool to it, and consume that information. Second, the Windows security event logs can be centralized through Windows event forwarding to one server. It could be a one VM server on your network. And at that point, you point your SIM to collect the data from that, that one location in that one server. The forwarded, so all the workstations forwards the event logs to that one server. Now be very careful because you could go crazy with how you got to be, you got to identify your use cases for picking which event IDs will go to that centralized server because you'll overload it and you'll overload the SIM. So in a budget sensitive situation, spin up a, a cheap VM, hopefully, a Windows box, turn on Windows event forwarding, um, if you're off the network, 
there are ways to get that traffic into that centralized Windows forwarding server. Um, yeah, that's a very good question. Did that, did that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other use cases you wish to answer? Go ahead. Well, the first use case you did was uh, Fishing, yes. With, with submitting, yeah. Won't that false positive if, you're, if your credentials are your email address and you're just submitting your email address? So the idea there is to identify your users and all your usernames. The second list is identify which websites should users, in general, it may not necessarily be your organization's websites, but in general, what sites do they go to? Baseline that sites. Yes, there might be some new domains that show up, new services online that show up, that have a username and password credential and that accept that. We get that. Uh, is, is, that what you, is that what the concern is? Yes, so it does, re it does require, no, it does not check for the password. It's looking for the string of the username in your proxy logs of the post. Yeah. You're posting your username yeah. to a, a website that's not on a whitelisted domain list. Yeah, the username is also your email address, but anytime you give your email address, then you find a false positive, right? That's not password reuse. That's don't, username reuse. I've never heard of that. But uh, does, that, does, that, does that address? Yeah, that's, that's a good point. If you depends what your policy is too. I mean, a lot of that's a very good point. Will yeah, allow you to do that, but yeah, if, if my username is Chris at corporate right. com, then yeah, you, anytime I give out my email address, that's gonna that's gonna your place on site. That's true. That's true. So that's, yeah, yeah, that's it would, need, it would need to actually check to see if there is a password form. Right. That's you could also put logic in your the query from the proxy that there's the word password in 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 the post. Or the get, or the associated get and post. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, good point. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Sure. Yes. The question was, how did you do, how did you baseline your server traffic? That was the question, right? Yes, analysis, data analysis. And you could go, you know, Sims, they, they can handle possibly years worth of data. Uh, you know, start with a month, month's worth of query. If you have that in your Sim, see, uh, you know, see what traffic the, your servers are going out to. Um, and, then, and then what you do is you would take that baseline list, maybe do some, uh, make a report for your sysadmins, the owners of those systems, add some information like, well, what IP country is this in? Or what is the who is on that, or, or what is the domains associated or the reverse DNS lookups on that um, host? Uh, what is the who is on that? What else could be? If it's on any threat intelligence list, obviously any third party, uh, threat intelligence lists. Yeah. What else could you do? Provide a report. Get them to validate it. There are some obvious ones like Microsoft. Hopefully you're not going to Windows Update with your servers, but you know it's possible. Okay, exclude them. And also for this use case, I wouldn't do a VDI environment like a so oh. That might be a little hard. I mean, that you might want to kind of right. do another use case as Ryan mentioned earlier, go into a blacklisted IP. Right, so, so, so Pete, Pete's point was there are some servers that, for example, they're user-based and you cannot do this with and just don't even try. <laughs> this is really trying to identify what we should know in our environment and what's beyond that baseline. Yes? Okay. Huh. That's right. Man. Well, you know, they'll alert you at a certain time of the day. The, the, the question is, the question is, how do you get your managed security service provider to do these things? Great question. Um, you, you're entering, you've entered an agreement. Let's say you've already entered an agreement with a, your MSSP. They, my experience is, they typically consider it a feature request. 
okay, get your feature request in. You have to have your, your SIM use cases documented first. That's why we're here. We're talking about them. We're trying to get them out in the open. Here, MSSP, do this. People are saying this is a really good thing to do. And it's putting pressure on them. If you don't, if you don't identify your use cases, and it's all, all use case management's basics. It, it, you know, you, your organization is unique, and that's the thing that frustrates me about MSSPs. Your organization is unique. Okay, you got me started. <laughs> no, that was thank, thank you, thank you. That was the. Yeah, it's I mean, push them, push them. Yeah, just keep pushing them, beg them, and eventually, I know in my own case. I'm not going to mention any big MSSPs. Eventually, I think as you build your team and you get better, you know, and you get better and better at it, you have to make that decision to just say, "Hey, I'm, I'm just going to bring it in house and maybe use an MSSP for a better reason." I, I mean, I, I was personally uh, part of that where we, like, I actually toured the. I, I'm trying to be. Um, <laughs> not give away. So I actually toured their center when they brought up our uh, customer name. They brought up our customer name, and it was just sheets of like they would have to look through all these notes. And my comment earlier was is that we could almost predict within the hour of when they were going to call us. <laughs> so I mean, it's great if you don't have. I think MSSPs are great if you don't have a an advanced team. Um, but I think as you start getting there, you start to figure out that maybe I could do this a little bit better. Well, my experience from out of the box tools is they they don't know your environment like you do or an analyst an analyst does. You and the same with MSSPs, sometimes they lose typically in general they lose focus to you know, what are your service accounts? Yeah. What are the servers that are supposed to uh, be sent, reaching out to the internet? They typically don't know that, and it's in it's almost there's almost a disconnect. You know, they're out there and wherever they are, yeah. sitting at home, and you're in the office. You know, there's there there you you have to have good interactions with your the system owners and the the the, the, the actually do things. Yeah, yeah, and I think I, I mean me and Ryan implemented. Uh, one when we worked together at a company and we spent most of the time just trying to figure out what we had and those asset lists we were talking about and trying to figure out and that was really like 50 percent of that initial three month period what was really figuring out what assets we have and we were in a large enterprise and, and it's just the way it is it's painful Yeah. Like, have you, in your experience, have any of those things done a good job creating that baseline for you or not? not really? I mean, the one I'm working with currently. I don't want to go to vendor specifics. Um, most uh, of the sims out there, most of the sims out there are are pretty good. It just comes down to manually looking at and baselining your data. I mean, most of them can do that. They can export to a CSV file. Do some do some unique. pivot tables. Yeah, and they'll give you unique and all that, like you know, when you're baselining. So they do give you some of that. Yeah, good questions. Yeah, we still got some time. What would you guys like to see more use cases? On? Any like, use what's cases? Really, what's really hurt? Like, what do you guys want to be able to detect? Add the tools. Command line login was a submission. That yes, thank you. Yeah. Admin tools, yeah. Yep. Data exfil. Any other ideas how to detect the exfil? Exactly. Lots, huh? Uh, yeah. I don't want the zip file to be changed into a PNG file because it's just compressed, and then you can um, just send out like images. Sometimes it'll just be like black screen or you can join them. Okay. Yeah. Encrypted update uploads of encrypted data. I believe was a submission. Yeah, right there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Or are you saying obfuscated or changed for file format or? Right. So in order, so the use case the gentleman referenced is that a PNG or a, a zip file can be changed to a PNG, which would then bypass some security tools. Uh, 
that's a good use case. No, I'm willing to bet that most organizations or some organizations may not have that ability to detect that as they're leaving your organization. Uh, we're assuming, you know, we're assuming that, you know, basic firewall stuff, basic, maybe an IPS might be able to catch that. There's a lot of watching for, for super rare files, but less of crunch files. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. Absolutely. Yeah, if you'd send us an email, it reminds you. There's, right, right, yeah, there's, there's several indicators of compromise, um, and like we said, we had the, uh, it's a great use case, thank you. And we, we tried to pick out the easiest, most organizations, most blue teams, basics, but I, yeah, I love that idea. I love talking about this. So, any other questions, comments, use cases? All right, we appreciate your time, everybody. Have a great DerbyCon.